This morning we continue our study of the great God who has saved us and his son Jesus. And uh, we're studying through the book of John. And this morning we're in John chapter 1. And actually this morning we finished the prologue. This is uh, the end of the prologue. But how foundational for our doctrine and for the truth of what we believe as Christians and probably uh, the truths that are held here have been challenged mostly through the years. If you study church history, uh, these are areas where the devil has attacked us greatly. And so uh, he has already introduced to us the Logos. We know that is Jesus. But in the Greek philosophy, Logos was um, the originator, the organizer of all thought and philosophy. And John just takes that and expands it to the point to understand that the Logos is the expression of God that we can know and that explains to us the grace and the goodness and the salvation that God brings. And so this morning, we're going to look at the attributes that are dem demonstrated by him, beginning in verse 14. John chapter 1 and verse 14, it says in the Logos, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, glory as the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Let me pause there. That word begotten does not mean one who is uh, uh, the firstborn of many, that he is, it means that he is the preeminent one. It glorifies Jesus as the only begotten, the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Verse 15, John the Baptist testified about him and cried out saying, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. This was John the Baptist, Jesus' older cousin. It said he existed before me. Verse 16, for of his fullness we have all received, and grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. The heresies that rose up in the first centuries of the church history, you find these uh, are the truths that are challenged the most. The deity of Christ, that he is fully God, and then today we're introduced to the humanity of Christ, that he's fully man. And really and truly without both, then the elementary truths of the gospel are depleted, that they are less, that they are destroyed. If Jesus is not who he says he is, then Jesus could not do what he said that he will do. And so this is foundational for us. But this is a, this is a sobering truth and reality when you think about not just how it benefits us, but what it what it means for Jesus to come, who was eternally and co-equally God, but who came to take on flesh. He was completely God, and he was completely flesh. That means that he lived a human life. He was not just an apparition. He was not just a, a spirit who just appeared, as the Gnostics would say, that that he didn't take on flesh. They believe all flesh and all physical is evil, so Jesus could not have taken on flesh. But we know that to be true, that he took on flesh. And you think about that sobering truth that the incarnation is something that happened that is new from any time. It's something that had never happened before, not in all of eternity. And it changed things. It changed at the very incarnation it, it is a sobering thought. Um, the word that is used here when it says, and the word became flesh is the Greek word, uh, agenito, and it, it is most profound. John MacArthur comments on it, and it says, if you think about that he is the, he is the, the one who became flesh, that the infinite became finite, that the invisible became visible, that the eternal allowed himself to be limited to time. That the supernatural one reduced himself to the natural. And yet when the Logos, completely God, whenever he did come, he didn't cease to be God. Instead, he became for us undiminished deity in human form. Oftentimes, 
I just sort of take that for granted, but through the years as it has been uh, denied and as the devil has tried in every way to bring confusion that Jesus was God, but also that Jesus was God-man. He was completely man, and if he had not been, then he could not have taken on our sin. He lived a perfect life, obeying the law of God perfectly. So when he went to the cross, he satisfied as a substitutionary death, as the Lamb of God sacrificed for my forgiveness. He took upon himself my sins and your sins, and he was able to satisfy that holy wrath. He was able to satisfy that judgment that sin deserves, that he took that upon himself. He who was infinite became finite so that this finite soul what he could pay in a short period of time, in a finite period of time on the cross as the infinite one that this finite being would have had to pay for it over infinity. And that's why it is so important that this truth is undiminished in our hearts. Jesus is fully God. He is fully man. Paul tries to capture that truth in the beautiful Doxology he gives in Philippians chapter 2, beginning verse 5. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. In other words, just to be held on to and demanding all the rights that went with it. Verse 7, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself to become obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee will bow of, things who, of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Whenever he says there, back in John 1, 14, and the word became flesh and he dwelt among us. That Greek word is eskenosin. And what it literally pictures for us is to, it means to uh, pitch a tent. It, it's the word tabernacle. The Living Bible says, and the Logos became flesh, that he identified with us, and he tabernacled. The Living Bible says, and he moved into our neighborhood. That God came to be part of us, one of us. He was completely God and completely man. You learn something when you live with somebody, don't you? Right now, this time of year, there are freshmen in college that, oh, they have looked so forward to being in college, and oh, it's going to be such a great year. And now then they're rooming with their best friend. Some of them are going to make it to Christmas and they're going to hate each other because they're living together. You learn something with people whenever you're living with them. That is what God has made available to us. That God, Jesus came and he dwelt among us. He moved into our neighborhood. And whenever you see this, there's some realities about the quality of God that Jesus reveals to us. He reveals to us the, um, the very glory of God, though oftentimes we don't think of it as the glory of God. He reveals to us the grace of God, and he reveals to us the goodness of God. That's what I want to look at this morning. First of all, that Jesus reveals to us God's glory. Now, when we speak of glory in the English language, most of the time it carries the idea of fame or or of honor or some renown. In the Bible, when it speaks of glory, it is, um, it is the picture of intensity, of light, of brightness that, that follows the being. In, in best illustration I could think of in our day in theater, whenever the theater is completely dark and a character is on the the stage and the spotlight shows on the character and follows that character wherever he goes. It is not the light, it is not the spotlight that gets our attention. It draws attention to the character and that's what glory means, that it follows the character, the person of God. But it also carries, in the Bible, it carries this imagery of this light that demands 
our attention that demands intensity, but also it evokes within us uh, a response. It's kind of like looking at the sun. You, you can't look at the sun. And that's what you see whenever the Bible speaks about the glory of God. All the rabbinical language uses the, the term about the glory of God as the Shekinah glory of God. And whenever God's glory was on display, that it drew the attention, but it also evoked a response of fear, of awe, of respect, of wonder. Let me give you an example. Over in the book of Leviticus, chapter 9, verse 23, Moses and Aaron went into the tent of meetings, that's the tabernacle, and when they came out and blessed the people, the glory of the Lord appeared to all the people. Then fire came out from before the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the portions of fat on the altar. And when all the people saw it, they shouted and fell on their faces. It's kind of like when the angels came and announced that beautiful night in Bethlehem, there was a child that was born, the Savior, and they went to those shepherds out in the field and said, um, today is born unto you in the city of David a Savior. And it says, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were so afraid. The book of Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3 talks about Jesus, and it says, and he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature. Charles Wesley gives us that wonderful Christmas carol and one line in it, it says, uh, veiled in flesh, the Godhead see, hail the incarnate deity. Why the incarnation? Jesus in all of the glory and splendor of who he is. Why the incarnation? Back in December, I, I was trying to make the point that um, not just that Jesus came but he left the wonder and the glory of heaven and all the praise of the heavenly host in heaven. And I said, do, we, do you ever think about where Jesus came from? And a sweet little voice cried out from the North Pole. Jesus didn't come from the North Pole. That was a good answer, though, wasn't it? Jesus came from the very presence of his Father, of the Holy Spirit, in the perfect unity as as God. Why the incarnation? Because if God had not become flesh, then our sins would still be required to be paid by flesh, by blood, by sacrifice. If Jesus had not come as the Lamb of God, he could not have taken away the sins of the world. Don't only think about what Jesus did for me and for you. Think about what Jesus, as God, what it encountered for a change for him, that he submitted himself, that God submitted himself. That is almost beyond what my human mind can think. It is most precious. John 1.1, 1, 1, it says, And the Word, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. That is a beautiful phrase. The Word is with God. The Greek word is, is prostan theon, and, and it means that, that Jesus is the second person of the Trinity. That, that is beyond what my mind can conceive, but that God is, he, he is one being, but he is three persons. He is one, but he's the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. And this word, this phrase means that, that he was with God, it means that he was in a face-to-face, -face, intimate relationship with the Father and with the Spirit. And whenever Jesus, who was with God in that, in that eternal state of, of fellowship, never, never a beginning, always, that Jesus, God the Son, that he changed things and he took on flesh. That is something that had never happened before. That was a change in the eternal plan of God that he set before the foundation of the world that the Father desired for our salvation and sent his Son, and Jesus left that close face to face, and he took on flesh. Never undervalue the incarnation of Jesus. It was a great sacrifice, sure, what he paid on the cross, certainly the blood that he shed, surely the death that he died, surely the power of his resurrection, but for him even 
to submit to come and be incarnated, to be flesh. That reveals God's glory to us and his love for us. Whenever Jesus died and you think of that eternal relationship and then you hear the words of Jesus and the fellowship he had with his father and the love that was contained there, Whenever he says in Matthew 27, verse 46, about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama shabachthani, which is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That God allowed my sin to be placed on the Lamb of God and bring the judgment that I deserved and that Jesus bore that. Don't ever devalue the cross, but certainly don't ever lose sight of the glory of God that was displayed when Jesus came in the incarnation. Jesus reveals the glory of God. When he spoke, everything else in this world identified him as God. When he spoke, the wind ceased. When he spoke, the waves stilled. When he spoke, the lepers were cleansed. When he spoke, the blind could see. When he spoke, the demons surrendered. When he spoke, the dead were raised. If you don't see the glory of God identified in who Jesus is, then you miss what the cross is all about and certainly you miss what the resurrection is all about. That he is God of the universe and he is God of my soul. Jesus reveals the glory of God. Secondly, back in verse 14, Jesus reveals the grace of God. Verse 14, he says he's full of grace and truth. In verse 16, John 1, 16, for of his fullness we have all received and grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth were revealed through Jesus Christ. The word grace is used over 200 times in the New Testament. Uh, one of the precious words that we use in our vocabulary as Christians is grace. Some of the songs that we sing uh, are about that wonderful, amazing grace, about grace that is greater than all our sin. Grace is important. I, I pastored a church that took on the name grace. Grace is important to us. As I said, it's used over 200 times in the New Testament. You know how many times it's used in the four gospel accounts? Somebody gander a guess? Five. It's not found in Matthew at all. It's not found in Mark at all. In Luke chapter 2, it's used where it says in chapter 2, it says, and Jesus grew in grace and knowledge and in favor with God and man. The other four times are in this passage. You know why? It's because the Gospels are more saturated with grace than any other book, I guess, because Jesus reveals grace. Every action that Jesus is, is grace. Titus chapter 2 and verse 11 says, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. Jesus brings grace wherever he is. Grace, and that beautiful phrase there, grace upon grace. Some of y'all, last few weeks, you made your way to the beach. You had to get that last trip. You loved the beach. I lived a half a mile off the beach for 10 years. I went to the beach three times, and that's because my wife and children guilted me to go those three times. I'm just not a beach person. I love the mountains, but I'm just not a beach person. But it is amazing to sit there and watch on a beach the waves roll in. And it's just wave upon wave upon wave. It just puts you to sleep on it. Some of y'all don't need that. Some of y'all are there now. Wave upon wave. That's the picture here. God's grace just keeps rolling in. It doesn't matter what you're facing. It doesn't matter what you're going through. It doesn't matter what your situation is. God is grace and gracious. The acronym for grace I heard as a child, it's God's riches at Christ's expense. Grace, the definition is unmerited favor. Grace, what we could never earn, what we could never repay God. Mercy is the other side of grace. Mercy is... Grace is what God gives us that we don't deserve. Mercy is what God withholds that we truly deserve. We deserve justice. We deserve judgment. But instead, God gives us grace. 
Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8 says, For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It is the gift of God. Romans 6, 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. God gives us grace, and the reason we can know his grace is because Jesus reveals it. And the last thing I want to share with you from this passage is not only does Jesus reveal God's glory, never miss that. Not only do we experience God's grace, but we experience God's goodness. Verse 18, he says, No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. If you think back to the garden, really even before that, what was the great sin of Adam and Eve, and what was the great sin of Lucifer himself? Lucifer, we're given a bit of understanding. We believe he was an archangel and that he was given the uh, responsibility to reflect the glory of God throughout the universe. And instead of recognizing that he was reflecting the glory of God, he grew prideful. And in his pride, he said, I will exalt myself until the throne to the sides of the north. I will be as God. What was the temptation that he brought to Eve and to Adam? Ye shall not surely die. For the day that, God, the, the day that you eat thereof, God knows that your eyes will be open. You'll be as God, knowing good and evil. If the ultimate expression of evil is when we try to be God, when the devil wanted to be God, the the expression of evil in our life is when we don't let God be who he is and that we try to run our lives. If that's the expression of evil, what is the greatest expression of goodness? When we try to become God, the greatest expression of goodness is when God became man. And he gives to us that wonderful, wonderful truth of his goodness. Matthew chapter 19, it's also told in Mark chapter 10, it's the story of the rich young ruler. Mark says that this rich young ruler came to him and said to him, um, Good master, what must I do to obtain eternal life? Matthew picks up that question. Teacher, good master, what good thing must I do to obtain eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why are you asking me what is good? Mark, Mark says, Why do you call me good? There is only one who is good. You know what Jesus was doing? He was connecting the dots for this rich young ruler. You call me good, but there's only one who's good. Do you recognize who you're talking to? There's only one that's good, and you've called me good. You've asked about good, and there's only one. The application for me is to understand that my salvation is not based upon my goodness. My salvation is based upon the goodness of God. Romans chapter 2 and verse 4 says, Or do not think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness or the goodness of God leads us to repentance. Today, I, I hope that you see the glory of God as it's been displayed through his great demonstration of love, that while we were yet sinners, that Christ died for you. I hope you see the grace of God that he offers us freely, the gift of faith in his grace, and if you will believe him and respond to him, then he brings salvation. And I hope every one of us today recognizes how good God is to us. And he is always good to us. God is always good. That doesn't mean all of life is good. But God is good. No matter what I face, the goodness of God leads me to be grateful. That's why Paul could say, in all things, rejoice. You're here today, let the goodness of God lead you to repentance. Come to know Christ. Let's pray.